This uh, piggybacks onto seminar number two in the sense that the topic is, is, is still, it's the, still the same. We're talking about how reading development happens. You want to think of reading development as a journey from I can't read any words up to I can read the newspaper pretty well. Okay, and all the changes that happen along that way. Once you get to about a third grade reading ability, say, from there on, I mean, certainly we improve, certainly we move beyond third grade re reading ability, but from there onward, the machinery is all in place. You just get faster and better. Along this way here, though, from I don't read any words to I can read the newspaper pretty well, there are all kinds of qualitatively different changes that happen, Th really interesting things that, that uh, change cognitively as the beginning reader, in the way the beginning reader looks at text, interacts with text, deals with words they don't know. There's some real clear changes that happen. Now for some kids, that journey of I can't read any words to I can read the newspaper pretty well happens very rapidly. For some kids, it's just, it's, it's hardly a struggle at all. They love it. It's easy as pie. They look at a word two, three times. They own it, and they just get better. They just progress so quickly. Other kids, as they traverse that journey, it's extremely difficult. And the way I think about it is they kind of either stop along the path and they get stuck, or they wander off to the side and kind of get lost, and they don't know, you know, everybody else is going on ahead, and they're kind of over here hanging out or, or mad and frustrated. And what we want to do is we want to we use text and word study to help them move along this pathway to become successful readers as quickly and as pleasantly and, you know, uh, effectively as possible. So how do we do that? We, last time we talked about what the reading process looks like for expert readers. Remember that they look at most words automatically, or recognize most words automatically, bring their vocabulary and their background knowledge to bear on that print that they've accessed, and make sense of the text. Okay? Now, now we're going to go back now and we're going to talk about what it's like to be a non-reader, a very, very beginning reader who say just knows the alphabet, just knows letter names and sounds, and what it's like to move along that journey and how text and word study instruction and intervention can lead that development, push that development if necessary. So that's our focus for today. Don't forget site coordinators to complete the following information and get this information to our wonderful administrative assistant, Nikki Fellows. Seminar number three, remember that your attendance at all five seminars is required, not just for university credit, but also for your early steps or next steps certification. And we need to get, that's why you need to fax the information up to Nikki, because if Nikki doesn't have the information, then we won't know that you were here. Okay, remember this? The famous equation, what uh, Goff called the simple view of reading, the interactive model that suggests that reading is a function of decoding and comprehension, and that both factors are critical. If one of them falls out, you don't get successful reading. Okay, that's, I can read the newspaper pretty well. Okay, again, we're talking about cognitive capacity. Expert readers devote most of their cognitive capacity to comprehension because decoding is effortless, automatic, fast, accurate, okay? Novice readers, however, and that would include beginning readers and struggling readers of any stripe or age, novice readers, however, are forced to expend large amounts of their cognitive capacity on figuring out what the words are, even sometimes remembering what a letter, what sound a letter makes. If you work with uh, dyslexic kids, sometimes they'll look at a word say even a simple word like jug, and they spend five to six seconds trying to remember if it says j, if the g says j or g. That is burning valuable cognitive capacity because most expert readers simply look at it and say jug. There's nothing to debate because they recognize it automatically, just like you did during the, the Stroop effect when you were reading red, blue, green, red. Okay? You weren't, you weren't sweating bullets over that. The only time you sweat bullets is when you had to override your automatic word rec. Okay? Okay. So, what we're going to talk about today is 
how do we get novice readers acting like expert readers? And we actually have a strong research base that sends us in some general directions. Now, the actual nuts and bolts of how you do certain things may vary and are certainly up for debate. But there is certainly a strong uh, research line, that about 30 years actually, of empirical research that suggests that indeed reading development happens in a certain way. And because of that, certain instructional methods are called for. And I've just given you here a few of the citations you could reference if you wanted more information on this. Um, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, I suggest getting all of those. Okay, so here's what we're going to keep coming back to today. The, and it sounds, you know, when I, when I write the type this out, I always think, oh, it sounds like gobbledygook, but you have to be precise. So I'm going to give you the cognitive term for it and then the way I think about it. Okay, what we're talking about is the nature of word representation in memory and how it develops. Okay, that's the gobbledygook part, but you'll get, it, you'll get it in a little bit. But it's also known as what's in the kid's head, what's in the kid's memory, and how does it change as the child learns to read. You, the way you want to think about word representation, a representation, it's a cognitive psych term, a representation, it's like having a card in a file box, a bunch of cards in a file box, like a Rolodex. Now, granted, you don't have a Rolodex in your head, but I think it's probably one of the better metaphors you can use. You can't get it perfect, but I think this, this helps. And so in this card, or on this card, okay, you have, so let's just say, let's take the word mm, card. No, I don't want to use card. That's not good. Let's take the word uh, 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 table. All right, let's take the word table. Right, just saying the word, everybody say the word table. Table, okay? You heard the sound, right? If I said, what's this, everybody? You would say to me, table, okay? You've got a, that means you, just the fact that you said that, that word, that string of phonemes, table, means that you have a phonological representation and memory for this. You know what this is, right? So you've also got a semantic representation, the meaning. So if you could, you could say that means sound, okay? In fact, I'm going to make it even more clear. This means you have the phonological re representation, the sound, table, and you have the meaning. You know what it is. This is in your head. This is in... The, the, even the pre-reader's head. They've got phonology and meaning. they got sound and meaning already for the word table, right? But what are they lacking? They're lacking an orthographic representation for, this, for table. They don't have any letters on their file for table. Okay, so this is the uh, pre-reader. Can you get this, Chris? Okay. You've been able to get these, right? This is the pre-reader. So then... What I'd like you to do take a minute and I want you to I want you to fill in what is what is in if that's a representation if that's a card in the file I want you to fill in what's there for the expert reader and you would be including phonological semantic and orthographic representations so pause the tape here and I want you to fill out the card for expert reader Welcome back. Here's what you would have in terms of representations for an expert reader. You have the sound table. You have the, that's the phonological representation. You have the actual meaning. You know what a table looks like. That's your semantic representation in memory. On the, at the same time, if you're an expert reader, you also have the spelling T-A-B-L-E, table. That's there in your head. And having that there nice and crisp and clean that's what allows you, when you look at these letters strung together in a piece of text, you automatically get all together orthographic, phonological, and semantic information, bam, all at once. 
Remember, we called it parallel distributed processing. All this stuff happens at once in, 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 a, in well, in 250 milliseconds. You know, when the eye looks at a, a piece of, uh, when the eye makes a fixation in text, it's, it's a quarter of a second. And you can take in up to 19 characters, plus or minus a few, all at one time in a quarter of a second. Okay? And so an expert reader gets sound, meaning, and the orthography, the spelling. Pre-readers just have sound and meaning because ain't got none of this stuff in memory yet. This stuff isn't there yet. So the challenge becomes how to get it there. So uh, another thing I wanted to add is that, remember, there's more than one piece of semantic information for table, right? For the sound table, for the orthographic representation table. There's more than just this kind of table. There's when you table uh, an amendment or table a, a bill. There's, uh, what are some other tables? A table, like a chart. So you would also have um, this kind of table in there. You want, there's also the notion of bringing stuff to the table, which is more of an abstract kind of a thing. So all of, these, all of this semantic information is attached to these phonological and orthographic representations. And when you read certain things, it act, they're all activated, but the, uh, the context tells you which one needs to stay activated in order to make meaning. So it's a really pretty complex system. Um, and, but for expert readers, it just works you know, automatically. Okay, so now let's think about if, if this is what expert readers do. They've got tons and tons of these, fi these cards in their file box that they can call up as soon as they see them in text. Okay, but let's, so we've been operating up here. Let's take the journey all the way back to, I don't have, I don't have any of these, this is all I've got. Okay, and let's start looking at text, print, from the vantage point of a pre-reader, a non-reader, a child who has no orthographic, orthographic representations in memory yet. Okay, so let's look at a piece of text, not quite. So we're going to ask ourselves, remember I, I said initially, you want to ask yourself, whenever you're working with kids in these early stages of development, and when you're looking at words, you want to say to yourself, what's in the kid's head? What does the kid already have in memory, and how can that help here? Okay, and where do we need to go from here? So if we're talking about the very first phase of reading development, the kids who are over here, I don't read any words, we're going to, Aerie calls those pre-alphabetic readers, okay? They're pre-alphabetic, meaning they don't, do, they don't deal with the alphabet. Okay? They, don't, they have letters and sounds, but not, not in relation to looking at text. Let's say that, that they know their alphabet individually. They can identify their sounds, but they don't have words yet in memory. Okay? When they look at a little book like this, so I'm over here at the Elmo now. When they look at a little book like this, can, and, and let's just say that I'm reading with a child. So I'm going to read first. Can you find the cat? And then I say, actually, Trina, can you come on up? Give me a hand here. Don't worry, you're just on Elmo. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this looks like early, early steps, right? And it is. Can you find the cat? Your turn. Can you find the cat? Can you find the frog? Can you find the frog? Can you find the crab? Can you find the crab? Okay, go ahead and try that yourself. Can you find the fox? Very good. Okay, try that one. Can you find the camel? Excellent. Okay, so keep this in mind. We're going we're gonna to go back to this a lot. Thanks. All right, so back to the screen here. So how was it, okay? Trina's a non-reader. She has no words in memory. How is Trina able to go, can you find the camel? You've got to ask yourself, what's in, what's in Trina's head? What has she got to help her in terms of words? Pretty much, this is what Trina would have. I mean, you can think of it as just a blur or just lines, but it's like looking at all X's. But how was it that Trina was able to go very precisely, can you find the camel? Site coordinators, you're going to pause your tape here for a second and ask, and I'd like folks to discuss how was Trina able to do that? She can't read the words.
Welcome back. Okay, how did she do that? Well, it's, it's interesting, okay? The pre-alphabetic reader, I like to call them the try anything reader, okay? Because they don't use, they don't have words in memory, so they try all kinds of stuff. They don't have any representations. Initially, they just have alphabet there. But you could even take a child who doesn't have any alphabet and they could still read. Can you find the camel after they, after they had enough um, experience with that text? The way Trina was able to do that, as I'm sure you figured out, was the text is so repetitive, so predictable, and the pictures so clearly cue what the next, what that unfamiliar word is, you don't really have to be able to read to do that. You, the child does what I call recite reading. Okay? So what the kids do is they use the word or the letter shape and the environment to try and come up with the word. So some kids, if you tell them, well, this is the word camel, pre-alphabetic readers will look at something like the humps in the middle or the stick at the end or the curly letter here, and they'll try to use uh, features from the word itself to remember what that word is. Now, that's not a reliable strategy because when you get other words that share those same things, they're going to be confused. Okay, it's not, it doesn't rely on the alphabetic system at all. It strictly relies on word shape, which is an unreliable strategy. So the point is, when you don't have any represent orthographic representations in memory, when you don't have any words up there in the head, you're reduced to relying on other things to figure out text. For example, in the case you just saw, because Trina doesn't have any words in memory yet, She's reduced to relying on these, knowing how to move across these chunks of letters and squiggles and stuff, relying on her memory. Can you find the, and then looking up at the picture, seeing a camel, and knowing, oh, that's a camel. Okay, so she's using word boundaries, memory, and pictures. Why? Because she doesn't have any words in memory to call on. So she's reduced to relying on other things frankly, that aren't very reliable. Like I just showed you, even if she was using the first sound, you can't count on everything that starts with k to be camel. Likewise, if she was relying on that middle hump-looking kind of thing, you can't rely on every word that has that thing being camel. You can't rely on the stick at the end being camel. So those are, uh, those are unreliable strategies. You can't always rely on your memory because no one and everyone's going to read you text ahead of time. You can't just rely on word boundaries, okay? So the pre-alphabetic reader is really uh, kind of, you know, up the creek without a paddle because they have to rely on these very unreliable uh, word recognition strategies. So the question becomes, how do we take the pre-alphabetic reader and move them into the next phase of reading development? Okay, because it's not going to be moving from here all the way over to expert reader, right? There's going to be a journey along the way. There's going to be a progression, a series of changes or phases that occur as the, as, as the reader becomes more adept at working with text. So how do we move them out of the pre-alphabetic, I don't have any representations in memory, so I just try anything kind of reader, to the next stage of reading development, which would be, Ari calls, partial alphabetic. The name is very evocative of what's happening. Readers in the partial alphabetic phase of development use, partially use, the alphabetic system that's in front of them in the text. They don't use all of it. Why? Because they can't yet. It's too cumbersome, too complex. Okay? So how do we move kids out of pre-alphabetic to partial alphabetic? Well, some of the things that we do in early steps are clearly calculated for that. We use predictable text to develop concept of word. Can you find the cat? Can you find the crab? Can you find the fox? Okay, we move them into being able to track print. Those of you who've done early steps know that that's not as easy as it looks. And for some children, it's exceedingly difficult to be able to match voice to print. The predictable, t predictable text is beautiful here because can you imagine trying to learn to point and match each word and to decode each of those words at the same time, for at-risk readers, that would be way too much, way too many things to learn at once. So predictable text actually takes the uh, stress of decoding out of the way, lets them rely on their memory, and just work on that, that tracking ability. Can you find the camel? 
can you find the fox and to get that down and under their belts before they're faced with the task of what's that word? What's that word? Oh my golly, what's that word? What's that one next? Okay, so developing concept of word, absolutely critical. And then to use initial consonants to help identify the unfamiliar word. For example, we're, we're, gonna, we're trying to move Trina out of pre-alphabetic to partial. Okay, we're going to read this book. Okay, here we go. Can you find the cat? Your turn. Can you find the cat? Can you find the frog? Can you find the frog? Okay, you know what's coming, right? Do you want to try that one? Can you find the crab? Very good. Go for this one. Can you find the dog? Okay. Sound? Can that be d, d dog? So, what's the sound again? So, what, what, remember what we said this was? It's a fox. Okay, thanks, Trina. Okay, what you saw right there is a perfect example of how we're trying to move Trina along out of pre alphabetic. She would have happily read along. Can you find the dog? Can you find it? Okay, because they don't really look at the text carefully, they're just looking at chunks of word, chunks of, of uh, letters. Okay. But by saying to Trina, wait a minute, sound, can this be d, d dog? No. So when we say, and then look at the picture, what do we call that? Fox. There you go. We're sending Trina an extremely important message here. By saying to her, no, sound, and making her look at this, what message are we trying to get across to this little beginning reader? So that's your, your question to speculate with your colleagues. What message are you trying to send to the student? What message are you sending to the child? Pause the tape. And we're back. The message is you got to look at the word. You can't just read along merrily and not paying attention. You've got to look at the word. And when you get stuck, for example, suppose Trina just stopped dead here. When you get stuck, you can use first sound to, to trigger the word out of memory. Looking at the words is important, and that's the message you want to send there. So how do we do this? How do we do moving, move kids towards partial alphabetic using the letters and sounds they know when they read? Picture sorts certainly do it because you get that first sound down, okay, um, really, really cleanly. When we have them write the sentence, the words in the sentence, and they're sounding out, they're trying to get all the words in, for example, uh, um, soccer, sock, or even if they spell it. Again, the notion is. I can use what I know about letters and sounds to encode and decode text. Early steps levels one through three, predictable text with lots of echo reading to get that finger pointing down really crisply. And then again, pushing for first sound, first sound. Every time you get, I'm going to go back to Elmo here. Every time you get the opportunity, when the child says, can you find the goldfish? Rather than saying, oh no, that's just fish, you want to again cue back to the word. What's that first sound? Well, it can't be goldfish, it's just fish. All right, try it again. Can you find the fish? And again, the child who gets here, can you find the, and they're stuck. They remember it's not dog, but they can't remember what it is. Again, sound. And that can help trigger the word. You want to get them oriented towards looking at the word. All right, so we've moved along a little bit. We've gone from pre-alphabetic, I don't have any words in memory, to partial alphabetic. I sometimes use what I can in terms of letters and sounds when I'm reading text. So this is what a partial alphabetic, if we look at the same sentence, can you find the camel? This is what a partial alphabetic reader is going to, has in memory what they have to use. So what I'd like you to do, speculate with a colleague. What does this reader have in memory? And what does this reader have in memory? They're both partial, but one's a little bit farther along than the other. So pause the tape. What does this one have? What does this one have?
And we're back. Well, as you probably noted, this particular reader can use first sound fairly frequently, okay? But doesn't really have any high frequency words in memory yet. This particular reader can use first sound, sometimes can use ending sound, and also has some high frequency words in memory to draw on. So they're both partial alphabetic readers, but this one's a little bit further along. So what would be the next step you'd want them to take? If they're consistently using first sound and getting high frequency, what's the next step you want them to take? You want them to start moving across the entire word. And you want to continue to build these high frequency words, more of them, more of them, and more automatic. So in that sense, you've been, you, she, you started out as a pre-alphabetic reader. Move to partial alphabetic reader. The next step is to become what's called a full alphabetic reader, which if you think about it, full alphabetic means you move across the entire word, not just parts of it. So let's look at that. All right, so those partial alphabetic readers, we, I call that, it's a start, okay? Because it is a start. It's better than trying anything, okay? Those kids, like we just saw, they use some letter sound connections, and then they guess because they can't move across the word yet. The vowels are usually ignored because the representations aren't there yet. Remember that all they have in memory for the word, for example, can, all they really have in memory that they can use reliably is first sound, and then they kind of fall apart. Okay, so it really looks like that. How do you move across the whole word? That's where we're going. The problem with partial alphabetic readers is for something like boat, they're liable to guess boot or beat or beast or boast. Or there, there are too many words that look, look like what they're, they're, it's, they're sampling the print, but they're usually missing the vowels. They're usually glossing over the vowels. It's better, but it's still not reliable. So if they're at partial alphabetic and they've got to get to full alphabetic, how do we get them there? Some of the techniques we use in early steps are calculated to make, help them make that progress. The text, we're going to move into levels four and six text. Slightly less predictable, but still with some good memory support. But we're also going to ask them to do what I call some cold reading. Okay? In other words, text that's not predictable, where they have to really reinforce and use their high frequency words that they're getting down. And in the short consonant vowel consonant words, they're going to have to work with short vowels, blends, consonant blends, consonant digraphs and use that blending strategy of moving across the whole word. And for big words, using initial phoneme. So in word study, you're going to see rhyming short vowels, early steps levels four to six text, less predictable but with lots of high frequency words. Think about your baby bear books, honey for baby bear, uh, present for baby bear, lots of words like the, said, you, and some predictable refrain but not nearly as much as in those early levels. And you're also going to see a lot of work in word bank working on those high frequency words. You said, come, there, here, is, okay? Your prompts to students when they're reading are going to start to vary a little bit more. So if your student, for example, say the text is can, you find the, okay, and say the word is fox. Now, instead of just cueing sound, now you're going to say, sound it out. And the child will say, oh. okay, so let's read it all, so let's read it again. Ready? Go ahead. Okay, so you, they moved across the entire word. That's what full alphabetic readers can do and should do. Partial alphabetic readers, you get them here and that's about it because they can't do the rest. Now, but suppose that the word here wasn't fox. Suppose it was squirrel. I don't think we're going to be blending that one, okay? So in that situation, your prompt could be, so the child's reading along and they say, can you find the, then I'd say sound, and then I say to them, squirrel. Because there's nothing to be gained from trying to blend through that. Okay? So you got to make your decisions. For the big words, cue first sound. 
For the little words they can blend, make them blend it. If worse comes to worse and they're really having difficulty, have them use their arms. Okay, so for example, as they go down, as they go down the, across the word, they would say, fox. Sometimes that tapping down the arm really helps there. But again, think about the big picture. Where are we going? I don't know any words. I'm a pre-alphabetic reader. Now I, use, now I use some of the parts of the words to figure things out. I'm a partial alphabetic reader. Now what we're doing is we're moving them toward being able to move across the entire word, full alphabetic readers. But they can't move across every word, just the little ones. Okay, so let's see how the full alphabetic reader has changed. If that's our sentence again, same sentence, what do full alphabetic readers have that partial alphabetic readers didn't have? In other words, where's the, where do you see improvement and where do you still see some progress that needs to be made? Pause the tape. Okay, and we're back. Well, you probably noticed that the child can move across a little consonant, vowel, consonant word like that. No problem. Even if they might not read can, but they might be able to go k and. The point is they can get across that word. This word is probably in memory as a high frequency word. Okay? Fine. Now it's interesting. This reader could, could use first and ending sound, but is bamboozled by the fact that it's not finned, which is what it should be. It's really an exception to the closed syllable. This reader got it, probably from contextual facilitation. They both have the in memory now as a high frequency word. And both of them can go k, and then they're stuck because it's a polysyllabic word. Okay, so that's what a full alphabetic reader brings to the table. Making progress, but still not quite there. A full alphabetic reader I would call, oh, anywhere early steps. Seven and eight, seven, eight-ish, into, pr into primer level. Okay, so, and we call full alphabetic readers moving across, I call them the moving across a whole word. I mean, because that's the big sort of woo, party down kind of uh, celebratory thing that's happened. They can finally move across a whole word. Even if it's just a little word, they can move across a word and get it. And that's a huge accomplishment. What these readers do is, They've got all the individual letters and sounds. They can even work with the vowels in a word, and now they can blend. So what happens is they can go k up and come up with cup. Okay? The more times they do that, k up, k cup, k up, cup. You and then they're also reading words like, uh, I'm trying to think of another UP word, s sup. There's not that many. Bup, dup, mup. <laughs> Well, as they read other words like supper, and they say s up, it gets more and more in memory. The more repetition gets to a better representation, they become sight words. That's the beginning of automaticity. What happens is, as the child reads k up, cup, enough times, eventually one day they look at that same word and they go k up. What that means is this chunk is now a representation in memory. Remember we talked about orthography? It's, it's amalgamated. Uh and p are now, there's something, you want to think about it as this. The child has this in memory, okay, the uh, and they also have p in memory, okay, but now they, all, they have built, they built that chunk, and as they read k up enough times, one day, they look at the word and they say, cup, which means they've got exactly what we have. They now have a representation in memory that has the phonology, the semantic information, and the spelling, the orthography, so that when they look at that word, they say, cup. It's there. It's a full representation in memory. The result of that over and over and over again with multiple words is that their sight word corpus grows. In other words, the words they recognize at sight grows. This is more reliable, but heck, it can be slow as molasses because they sound like they're in first gear a lot. Okay, the next stage after full alphabetic reader 
is consolidated alphabetic reader, or consolidated reader. Yeah, the consolidated alphabetic. These readers look at a text like this and they read, can you find the camel? Because all of those words are in memory, okay? And how do we get them there? More and more text with cold reading. In early steps, what we do is we, you're going to be working at the mixed non-rhyming short vowel level, all the way up into vowel patterns. Early steps levels 7 through 10, where they've got a lot of instructional level cold reading. The word bank includes more difficult high frequency words like could, they, and because. Okay, and the result is, what happens is it becomes a real practice effect. It's really driven by practice and also some, some word study instruction. You have more and more spellings become amalgamated together, just like we talked about with that cup where k up became k up, and then finally cup in memory. That happens for more and more words. So the, let's say a second grade, second grade level reader has a lot of words in the Rolodex. Okay, for example, a word like school, when they see this orthographic, when they see this orthography, they come up with the phonological you know, uh, connection, school, and they have the meaning with it just automatically. But when they look at a real big word like this, they don't have transportation built yet. There's all kinds of little chunks they put together. They might be able to work with the trans part and they see the tape, but this Asian thing is too tricky. This, they tend to gloss the middle because it's wedged in there. Okay, so they'd say trans, and then they would probably need some help or at least some contextual facilitation to get it. So the larger and larger and, chu larger and larger chunks are available for the chunking strategy. The point is, you want to see where we've come from. We went from I can't read any words with the pre-alphabetic reader to the I use some of the letters in the word, the partial alphabetic reader, to the full alphabetic reader who can move across a lot of words and has, develops actually, quite a few sight words, meaning words they can recognize at sight, automatic words in memory, but they still lack a lot of the uh, more complex ones, to the consolidated alphabetic reader who for the most part a lot of the text they access is uh, the words are sight words in memory. From there, you know, once you get to here, all the pieces are in place. The foundation's been laid. The machine is running. Now it's just a matter of time and experience to get more and more complex words in their own, on their own Rolodex uh, uh, file card. But along the way, there have been some fairly dramatic changes. If you think about the difference between a child who doesn't, only uses the picture to figure out the word fox. That's the pre-alphabetic. The child who uses the f and the picture to figure out the word fox. That's the partial alphabetic. To the child that looks at the, the word and goes f -a -x, confirms it with the picture and says fox. To the child who looks at it and says, doesn't even really need the picture, just says fox because they recognize the word. When you think about that journey, that's a lot of change. For some kids, it happens in a matter of weeks. Other kids, the kids we work with, get stuck somewhere along the line for a lot of the words that they have to deal with, and they develop a lot of a guess and go kind of strategy. The result of that is they don't ever develop that nice, clean, They don't develop that nice, clean orthographic representation where all the letters are spelled out, the sound is there, and the meaning. They've still got lots of X's. So they look at a beginning sound and they guess because that's all they've got there. The rest of the word is not in memory yet. So our challenge becomes how to clean up all these X's. And get that in memory. See you next time.